All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, this view uh, is familiar to those of you who have seen some of my recent videos where I have used this spectrogram analysis of sound to talk through some, um, some music that I've written, some electronic music. This view I find particularly useful to talk about structure and um, attributes of the sound when that sound is otherwise harder to describe using uh, common practice language, um, when there isn't really a sense of uh, structured harmony, uh, when the piece is, is uh, primarily timbral. Uh, this is a very useful view. Um, it also turns out to be a very useful view when you're looking at music of any kind, uh, whether that's music uh, that's sort of experimental and spatial, like some of this stuff is, or whether it's uh, even music that does come from that common practice time, um, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Gershwin. There, there's, a, um, there's a useful insight that comes from looking at a spectrogram of music that allows us to uh, enhance our other analysis. That banging in the background on my dogs, again, uh, you're familiar with the dogs if you if you watch this channel. They have a very hard plastic toy that they're playing with right now, and there's a wood floor in this room, so they are thumping away at it. I'm not going to try to wait until they're done, and I'm not going to try to edit it out. You can enjoy it along with me. So, um, a couple of you asked what this tool was, and um, a, a subset of the couple of you that asked were interested in, in how I used it in terms of the values and the settings to get to this view. So that's what this video is going to be about. Um, I did debate whether I would start with the uh, broader aesthetic reasons why I like this, sort of the tangential discussions, um, and make you wait for the technique. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get right into the configuration of this tool. Uh, but I do want to show a couple of things first. So bear with me for two, three minutes, and then we'll get right into what all of these values mean. Uh, but first, this is um, not new. It's not uh, a 21st century idea to look at sound like this. If I dig through my library, there's a book here. New Images of Musical Sound by Robert Cogan. I don't remember the date from this, but maybe it was the 70s. I'll take a quick look here. Uh, 1984 is when it was published, but his work obviously uh, extended before then. You can see that in this book he has uh, taken spectrographic analysis of, of music. Uh, this particular instance this is some, some Debussy, and there's an, there's an interesting analysis available to the musical theorist looking at um, Debussy as a sonic structure. So regardless of the harmonic content, what is the sonic structure of the piece? And the, the two approaches overlap and enrich each other. Uh, but you'll learn something if you do a harmonic analysis that you won't learn from looking at a spectrum. And you'll learn something looking at a spectrogram that you would not learn if you were to focus on pitch set analysis and, and, and chord progressions. Uh, what, I, what I found as I've gotten into this, and I've, I first came across this when I was a graduate student in the early 90s, is that quite often the the emotional peak of the piece coincides with uh, the highest or lowest uh, pitch in the spectrum, the richest or lightest, right? Any of the extremes within the spectrum often line up with the uh, emotional peaks of the music. And for some music, uh, this is the clearest way of showing those kinds of gestures. Um, and so there is a, a way in which this kind of analysis is an emotional and uh, can influence the emotion of the performance. So there's music that's a bit 
baffling without this kind of view. And then this music that is otherwise uh, descriptive using or describable using um, chord progressions and, and sort of maybe a Shankarian approach uh, where this embellishes that, particularly Schenker. So the, an earlier book by Kogan, uh, Sonic Design, uh, The Nature and Sound of Music. In this book, he is not uh, using spectrogram, but he's using other graphic notation to show how um, the structure of a piece can be abstracted. Um, you can see how this looks very Shankarian, although it's obviously not a um, standard er early. So this this book kind of uh, predates conceptually the, the images of musical sound. And the two together provide a really uh, a really beautiful and elegant way of thinking about music, whether it's analyzing music or whether it's, in, in my case, I like to use it when, I've, when I'm working on an electronic piece. This view allows me to uh, think about the piece as a, as a unit, as an entity, right? As a, as a, as a, as a unfolding element, as a, as a unit that unfolds in time. This view abstracts out the, out the time. Okay, so I'm waffling on already. You just want to know how to use Sonic Visualizer, but I want to show you two more things. I've got a crate next to me here, uh, because one of the things I like to do, in some cases, these are visualizations of a set of pieces I call the scratch pieces. This one's probably a little harder to see on camera. Where the, uh, the form of the uh, spectrogram is as important as the music itself. And when these were performed, um, those images were available to the audience as well. But I also have um, 32 of these. These are probably some of the earliest, this was variation one of the Goldberg variations, I conveniently wrote it on the back, variation two. And I had these, um, I still think these are quite exquisite. Variation three. Maybe I'll scan these in. Um, variation four and onwards of the Goldberg variation. So I had these in a grid on my wall for a long time. Uh, and I still have them in this in this crate here. So did I learn anything from about the Goldberg variations by doing that? Um, not, not specifically because I wasn't looking at it that way. I was looking at it as a as an art object on its on its own, but I used this tool to do that as well in earlier version. Okay, so let's look at this screen here. Um, again, not getting into the maths because that's not why you're here, but the x and y axis. First, it's obviously it's time, and then it's frequency. And these frequency, the, the frequency here is broken up into bins. And uh, that will become important when we look at the settings. But you can see like 3014 to 3079 to three, th um, 3149, 3219. These are bins. And the size of these bins is one of the first elements that needs to be determined, not just for the uh, underlying analysis of the piece, but for the display of it. And then there is time, which are windows, slices of time. And the, the way I think of this is that there is a slice of time, and in that slice of time, which is uh, small, but could be larger, what are the frequency overtones that are present in that bucket of window and that's what's represented here. There's a, a blip for every place where there's overtones. Now this piece here is very dense down at the bottom, a little bit lighter up at, up at the top. That's fairly normal for instruments. This was an electronic piece but um, if you 
uh, if you look at the piano, for example, um, richer down in the middle, less so up at the top. Uh, I worked a lot on the scaling of these because I wanted them to look like objects. I wasn't interested in the analysis per se, I was interested in the output. So when you look at the spectrogram analysis using any of the tools, whether it's Sonic Visualizer or something else, that is the, the first decision that you'll need to make. Now, this piece from Even Dust, uh, to get it to look like this, you have to make a bunch of choices in these settings over here. Because if I were to just start again, so I'm going to new session, and I want to open just the wave form from even dust shall certain beauty rise. Okay, so this is the first thing that you see, which is obviously very different. So what 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 are we seeing here? This is this will be the default view when you open up Sonic Visualizer. Well, first what you're seeing is the wave form, not the frequency analysis. This looks familiar from um, Audacity or from the waveform in any DAW, right? This is amplitude of the total waveform, where it's louder or softer. And the complexity of the amplitude gives an indication of the uh, um, sonic characteristic of the sound. But it is amplitude, not frequency. Um, this could be. Uh, um, any sound. It, it, you, you would be hard-pressed to tell from the waveform here what the, what the interesting attributes of the, of, the, of the piece are. What the frequency domain does is it, um, it flattens out the amplitude. So imagine this were a sine wave going up and down with an equal phase waveform, equal wave shape. That is a single pitch. If you were to shift back to the frequency view of that sound, the oscillation of the sine wave would no longer be present. What you would see is a single line for the same pitch. And that to me is a really powerful shift. We'll get to that at the end when I continue or revert back to waffling because I think that there's an implied step beyond the frequency analysis. So let me just lay this out and then we'll, I promise we'll continue to work on the details. What has, what has the same relationship to the frequency domain as the frequency domain has to the amplitude domain? And I think it's a view where time is on the y-axis and something else, the infinite, I don't know, the void is on the x-axis, but we'll come back to that. All right, so here you are in Sonic Visualizer, and you see the waveform, and that's kind of groovy. You like it, and you can play it. I don't know if you'll hear it if I play it, but uh, you... I didn't really set it up to play. Uh, the first thing that, that, I, that I want to do is um, select everything and then zoom to fit. Now you can see the whole piece. And uh, you may not want to do this. You may want to zoom in. You can certainly do that. But for the initial view, zoom to fit. But I'm also, I'm not interested particularly in this waveform. I want the spectrogram. So underneath pane, I'm going to say add spectrogram. This is a uh, two-channel piece. Uh, unusually for me, most of my pieces are in mono. And I want to do the analysis based on just, there you go. Okay, now I'm going to close down this waveform pane because uh, oops. it's not going to let me delete pane. Pain, delete pain. Whoops, did the wrong thing. 
pain, delete pain. There we go. Now, uh, as I was saying, because as far as the waveform is concerned, all of the useful information is contained down here. You can uh, choose whether or not to view the different overlays. I would suggest not showing these, uh, I would suggest leaving these in while you're figuring everything out. But at the end, when you want to take a screenshot or, or playback, you might not want to see all this nonsense here. And so the view menu allows you to hide some of that stuff. But okay, this, um, although interesting, is not as useful as the view you had. Remember, this is the same piece that I had up before, right? Um, you can see some indication of the general shape down here. But all this stuff up here is, to me, not useful to demonstrate. I, I recognize that from a, a completist analytical view, it's interesting to know that the full auditory spectrum up through uh, up through to 20,973 hertz is uh, is activated. And there, there may well be uh, waveforms and uh, sonic gestures that uh, don't have that, that are very precise. Uh, for example, your sine wave of a, of a flute would not have all of this rich harmonic texture up above. Uh, it's interesting to see that within that, there's a bit of a, a bit of a focus here around 11, interesting, and a little focus around 17. But I'm interested in this stuff down here. The first thing I'm going to do is use this scroll wheel here to use to do the vertical zoom. Now this is not intuitive. Um, and you're just going to have a mess around. I dragged it down, and you see it that what dragging it down uh, shrank the window. Now I'm going to drag it all the way down to the bottom, and that focuses in on the area that I'm most interested in. Before I go any further with that, I'm going to make some changes here. So there's a bunch of different formats that you can choose. I think I used green on the last one, but uh, if you wanted to look kind of classic, you could use white on black. I don't find black on white particularly useful. Uh, some of these more colorful ones, the color represents amplitude, right? If something is particularly loud, it'll be represented with a slightly different color. Um, I, like, I like green, I think it makes sense. Um, red is louder in, in this view. Then um, scale is the um, uh, the representation of, of, of that amplitude, right? It, um, my understanding, again, this is, I'm sure, partially or wholly inaccurate, but it, uh, it provides a threshold on what's represented. I put it on linear because I get this nice clean view. Uh, I'm sure if there was a, a it, the default is uh, dB, I'm not, and I'm not interested in that view. I want to be able to see the shape of the music. So I set it to linear and um, I don't muck around with this, but you can try different things. One caveat, often when you make any of these changes here, it can take a minute to redraw, um, just be prepared. All right, now, uh, window is the, uh, the time bucket here. I like 496, I don't know why. And I set it to 93.75. Again, I don't know exactly what this is doing. Um, and then I find that I like this set to two. Okay, it's going to scroll a bit while it's redrawing, like I said. It redraws. So all of this is to create a view that I find useful, but also um, aesthetic. 
um, because some of this um, the the spectrographic output is uh, is beautiful. So it's worth tweaking the, the 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 distinctions. You can already see this piece, and you remember this from when we talked about it, has a pretty straightforward structure. Um, it's quiet, and then it's a big block of things, and then there's a little bit of a tailing at the end. But within that, you can drill in and see how the unfold. It's a big drone piece, right? Uh, but it, but it shifts and changes over time, and you can see when we drill into the details of this view, uh, you'll be able to see the where those shifts take place, how they gradually un unfold. It's, it's a way that you couldn't notate in paper because it was an improvised electronic piece. Then um, all, here we go, the bins are the, uh, the frequencies. I like to use peak bins, again, because I want to see the, um, the highlights. I want to see where it's doing something that is really perceptible. There's totally a use case where you, you want a fuller set of, of data, but to me these are uh, filters on the on the view. That's not an accurate way of looking at it, but it's the way I would use it. I use linear as my frequency scale. This is really important. Uh, if it's logarithmic, you can see that the uh, distances in the buckets at the top are um, larger than the distances down below. Now this is actually quite a good, quite a nice view. Um, it, it fills the space up, right? And we hear things logarithmically, like the um, the if if uh, sound the the perceived loudness of sound is not not linear. Um, high high sounds. Uh, have more energy to them. Um, so that makes sense to have a logarithmic view, uh, but here's what I prefer to do instead. I prefer to have a linear view and then um, continue to muck around with this, with this view here. Oops, there we go. Right, I kind of like I like that view. I think it maintains the uh, patterned integrity a little bit better, which is ultimately what I'm looking to do. Now you can continue to faff around with this. It's really awkward. Uh, there, there isn't, as far as I can tell, a way to just type in the value. Uh, but there's the view that looks like what we had. Now, if I wanted to zoom in, Now you can start to see uh, I, I could just do it. I could also use this here. Oops, I never remember which way to go. Um, right, you can see I'm getting more detail and this is where you start to get um, interesting views on the um, on the pattern that's within the within the texture. So by all means, mess around with with these different views. Uh, I uh, find them baffling, um, and but they do show different, you know, different views. Here's the DB one that we started with, uh, but again, I like I like linear. So those are the settings that that are available to shape the view. Um, get back to zoom to fit here. Let me think within Sonic Visualizer. So down, Sonic Visualizer is free from a university in London, and I can I think it is it Queen Mary University. But if you search for Sonic Visualizer, you'll find it. You'll notice that it comes. It's it's one part of a three or four. Uh, it's a suite of applications that do different analysis. And uh, 
there's all kinds of plugins that come along with Sonic Visualizer that allow you to do really cool things. Like, for example, uh, take a spectrum like this and extract MIDI information from it. Um, it starts as XML, and then it can be formatted into MIDI, which then you can use to um, run a MIDI device, for example. Or, uh, depending on what you've told it to find, like there are uh, plugins that allow you to select um, only the fundamental or only the peak frequency or diff you know, different views on it that uh, give you the ability to abstract out information from Sonic Visualizer. So look, if I, I think I actually might already have, have told you all of the non-specific tools about why I think this is so cool. I mentioned the the domain beyond frequency domain, which I think gets into sort of a like a Buddhist base of consciousness type of space or Heideggerian um, being in time. Uh, and I think music as a as an experience prompts us to think about that, right? When I talk about Messi on, on this channel, it's because I think his music specifically points to the domain beyond the beyond the frequency. Um, I have a, a notes planned to talk about spectrogram analysis of whale song, and uh, that comes from the uh, reading I did of uh, Tom Mustel's book How to Speak Whale I talked about that last week so I use this a lot and uh, I use it less now than I than I used to but I really did uh, I really did get a lot of early inspiration out of the idea of sound as a gesture and sound as a gesture that can be represented in this format and this format then is, is now a visual representation, but it's also a mathematical structure that, that in, in principle could be represented in another medium, not sound, maybe electromagnetism, which then gets into the idea of um, radio uh, art for radio telescopes and uh, um, art that is represented in... Um, physical media. I have a dream of being able to construct a perfect rectangle of water that's acres long and uh, recreate the structure of a specific piece of music in the wave. Now you get the waveform in water, but there must be a way to, to form it. It's like a science fiction art piece. Gravity, why not use music as an interface in a waveform that then uh, can be um, transposed or trans sorry, transduced onto gravity. That surely to me would be an indicator of extraterrestrial intelligence. A quick note, transposition is changing the frequency within the same medium. Transduction is a shift in media. So this gets into all of readings about McLuhan, uh, hot and cold media shifts between um, oral and electronic and what comes after electronic. Um, there's a really rich thought behind all of, uh, behind all of this stuff. So anyway, uh, if you made it this far, bravo. Uh, like and subscribe, share the video, all that kind of stuff. If you have questions, please let me know. Uh, if I'm saying anything that's absurdly wrong, uh, well, let me know. But uh, I know I'm wrong. I hope I'm not absurd. If I'm ridiculously wrong, let, let me know. And I will adjust my thinking accordingly. But at this point, I'm an old dog. And uh, uh, yeah, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, right? Anyway, cheers. Keep your wits about you.